Hello and welcome to uh, a special additional episode to the Northumberland Castle series. Today I'm back in Cresswell, situated on the Northumberland coast and I'm actually filming inside Cresswell Peel Tower. When I filmed the original episode uh, back in August of 2021, um, Cresswell Peel Tower was still being renovated um, and it was inaccessible to visitors. Recently, I made the acquaintance of a chap called Barry Mead, who happens to be the um, caretaker, curator of this place, um, but also a local historian and archaeologist. And he provided me with a wealth of information um, about the tower and the Cresswell family. Um, and has allowed me access to the inside of the tower to film today. So a big thank you to him for that. I couldn't therefore waste the opportunity um, of passing up this uh, information and the possibility of making another episode. So I've decided to add an additional bonus episode to the Castle series. Um, and the content I filmed last time is greatly expanded and in much more interesting detail. So sit back and enjoy. The first records show a Robert de Cresswell living here in 1191. The original dwelling here would have been some kind of fortified manor house. And of course, as we've discussed in the castle series, that was essential in these parts due to the border conflicts between rival families and of course, skirmishes with the Scottish. Rival families from both sides of the Scottish border um, fought, feuded, killed, and stole each other's cattle in an endless turmoil over hundreds of years. Of course, we all know that they were commonly known as the Border Reavers. But let's face it, even the Romans back in their day drew a line through the Tyne Valley um, and built the wall and rarely ventured north of it. But don't be mistaken into thinking that these were savages and uh, you know, bands of highway robbers, because they weren't. Um, these were often titled families, the lords and barons of the area. In medieval Britain, the northern region of Northumbria, had become lawless and wild. And although sheriffs were appointed by the crown to control the area, they never fully prevented the Reaver raids happening. In 1380, a John Cresswell lived here with his family, and he was captured and held to ransom by some Scottish invaders. The ransom of 40 pounds, sounds not a lot, but it would have been a small fortune in those days, was paid and he was released. Um, just to give you an idea, um, a pound in 1300 was equal to 710 pounds today. So 40 pounds would have been worth 28,400 pounds, equivalent to a lottery win. With one pound, you could buy a horse or two cows, and it was 100 days of wages for a skilled tradesman. 28,400 pounds would have kept that person in employment for 77 years. So it's believed that it was he who built the Peel Tower here um, to guarantee that that ordeal would not happen again. 
Peel towers were the best way to defend yourself in medieval times, if you could afford one, that is. In the original castle series, I explain the hierarchy of fortified dwellings. The richest built castles, the wealthy built peel towers like this, and the not so wealthy built bassel houses. And the poor, unfortunately, had timber and straw houses with no protection at all from border reavers or Scottish raiders. Of course, it wasn't just the border reavers or the Scottish that regularly invaded this part of Britain. Um, you had the Anglo-Saxons, for example, and the Vikings. So it was a constant uh, period of turmoil over hundreds of years. The original episodes in this series explains more on each of those types of fortifications that I've just mentioned. Um, but for this program, let's examine what a peel tower was. Well, it was basically a small castle. There were over 175 that we know of littered all over the north of England, um, both west and east. Most peel towers consisted of three floors, each one a large single room, and a rooftop lookout, if you like, or platform come battlements. Um, though some larger ones had four or even five floors, the Peel Tower here at Cresswell in the 1300s had other small buildings around it, such as a chapel and other living quarters. And that was all within a perimeter wall known as a balmkin. The ground floor room um, that I'm in now, as you can see here, had a tunnel or barrel vaulted ceiling. The name comes simply from the resemblance to a tunnel arch as it is here, but also resembling the segments of a barrel. The idea of this type of construction originated in the ancient cultures of Egypt and India and was used extensively throughout the Roman uh, Empire in Roman architecture. This type of construction was extremely strong and the only real disadvantage to this um, was that gravity pushing down exerts the force going out. To prevent collapse, the walls had to be extremely thick which of course suited the purpose of a tower. It was also to provide an impenetrable um, ceiling to protect whoever was above. It also allowed ceilings to span huge spaces not possible with timber, and obviously timber floors were vulnerable to burning during attack. Both basal houses and towers were similar in that they both had ground floor basements with barrel vaulted ceilings and living quarters above. The difference was in a basal house, this basement floor was used for keeping prize cattle in as well as storage. Usually they had a narrow doorway at the end um, for access, but there was no way up to the living quarters above. Um, access to the living quarters would have been via an external ladder, which would have been uh, withdrawn uh, in times of siege. Of course, a doorway um, meant that there was uh, a point of access for intruders but usually above that doorway 
would have been a narrow um, slit type window where if someone was attacking that door, boiling water or other projectiles could be dropped on them to deter them. Now in a peel tower, that was different. The construction of the ceiling was the same as it is here in uh, Cresswell, but there was no access at all from outside, um, providing maximum protection from invaders. The cattle would have been protected within the perimeter wall or barmkin outside, so no need to have them in this lower floor. Access to appeal tower was always via a doorway on the first floor, accessed by a ladder, which was withdrawn, similar to in a bassel house, or sometimes accessed from a walkway from an adjacent building. This uh, doorway here at Cresswell was not here in the original construction and early drawings and diagrams confirm this. It was added later and the experts can't decide exactly when it was installed, but it was almost certainly sometime after peace was restored following the unification of Scotland with England in 1603. My guess is that it would have been put there when William Cresswell built the mansion onto the side of this tower um, in 1750. And you can see here another doorway that was put through to provide access on the ground floor between the mansion and the tower. But more on that later. Peel towers, therefore, with basements with no access, had spiral staircases connecting the downstairs storage area to the living quarters above. The first floor, which is where I am now, um, was the living quarters uh, and the access to this floor at Cresswell was through this doorway here behind me. Um, it's in the middle of the wall and it was almost certainly accessed by a ladder which would have been withdrawn in times of siege. Now there's no actual records that after the tower was built that it was ever attacked, but that doesn't mean to say that it wasn't. It's just that there are no um, records available um, suggesting that. On this floor, there would have been a kitchen, which you can see here. This small, narrow chute just to the left of the fireplace was for throwing slops and waste and that literally went out through a hole in the wall and into the ground below. Um, on the other side is a fireplace where you would have sat to keep warm I guess and in the corner a garderobe and the English word for garderobe is a loo um, and you can see here that this stone ledge is where you would have perched your bottom and then you would have done whatever you needed to do and that literally went out through a hole in the wall um, to the place below. And of course, you know from your history that of course in those days, um, excrement and waste was um, the, the dangers were not appreciated, um, hence the Black Plague uh, that followed hundreds of years later, of course. But then I'm rambling, so I'll get back to the subject. Um, small, narrow windows that you can see in the top of the walls here um, allowed some light in, 
but were designed deliberately to reduce the risk of arrows and other projectiles being thrown into the building. Now, an arrow wouldn't probably do much damage, but um, if somebody was attacking a peel tower, what they would try to do is set it on fire. So you might have had a lighted arrow coming in through a small gap, setting fire to um, uh, straw bedding or whatever, and then obviously the family would have had to evacuate it, and at that point the tower was no longer defended. So that was the reason for these small windows and the lack of them. The upper floor um, provided sleeping quarters for the family. And I have to say here, um, the upper floor is no longer there. Um, but even so, looking at the ceiling heights, that would have made each of the floors, if this was the height of the um, living floor, then the space above it would be extremely low. Um, maybe it was easier to heat that way, who knows. Cresswell had a shallow pitched um, sandstone tiled roof. Um, and when Barry was excavating the site with his team, they came across such tiles with the hole in where the pin would have been used to um, secure them to the roof rafters. The walls around the roof had a parapet with um, projecting um, machicolations which were designed so that projectiles or boiling water could be dropped on any invaders trying to gain access or trying to scale the walls with ladders. I say the word machicolations um, because earlier in the series I pronounced that word as maculations, which is incorrect. So my apologies for that. The word is actually pronounced machicolations. And that is because the word machicolation comes from the French word machicoli. The design of them were borrowed, if you like, um, by the Europeans um, after the Crusades in the 11th century in Syria. So it was the Syrians that came up with the idea and the Europeans brought it back and incorporated it into their uh, towers and castles. Now I have to say here at Cresswell it has one such machicolation but it's on the back corner of the tower. Now according to Barry um, this was not used uh, for defence. It was simply a loo for whoever was manning the battlements up at the top. And he's probably right, because if you think about it, it, there's only one, and it's on the back corner of the tower, not where you would want to defend. It, obviously, the, your main defence would be above the doorway. And so he's probably right, it probably was just there to scare the Scots off, um, but not actually used as a actual defence. It is thought that the Cresswell family only used this tower um, as a temporary retreat when there was a risk of invasion and that in peaceful times they lived in adjacent buildings within this balmkin or perimeter wall. After the union of England and Scotland in 1603, Peace was eventually restored to the borders and by the 1620s Peel Towers were not so important any longer um, and largely became abandoned and robbed of stone for the building of other buildings and dwellings. Cresswell Tower survived though and by the mid 1700s um, it was a William Cresswell who was living here and he added a mansion house to the north wall of the tower, which is this wall behind me. 
And here you can see where the roof abutted the north wall of the tower. It's clearly visible where the stone was channeled. And you can even see where the upper floor rafters would have been tied into the wall. The Cresswells abandoned the tower and mansion only 20 years later, seemingly having gotten into financial difficulties. The property was then let to several working families in the village um, until it eventually fell into disrepair due to the lack of maintenance and it was demolished in 1845. Here you can see what is left of the front entrance to the mansion um, and it's been left for some reason um, and it's included in the perimeter wall of the tower as it stands today. I digress a little bit from the history and we'll just venture into legend for a moment because the tower is said to be haunted by a white lady who's been seen several times um, over the years in the past. And the legend is that Cresswell's daughter fell deeply in love with a Danish prince and they planned to elope to be married. As the prince landed on Cresswell's shore, um, he was ambushed and killed by her jealous brothers. She was so grief-stricken, she died of a broken heart soon after. And sightings of her standing on the battlements um, looking out to sea have been seen several times over the years. The local history group um, have created this effigy which is on display in the tower. Okay, now back to the history. To the west of the tower, Addison Cresswell built a magnificent hall around 1818 after coming into considerable wealth through marriage to an Elizabeth Reed. Now Elizabeth's benefactor was a chap called John Baker, who was her cousin, and he stipulated that the inheritor of his money must add the name of Baker to their own. So the family became Baker Cresswell, and that was later changed to Cresswell Baker in 1840. Um, and you might recall from when we visited Preston Peel Tower earlier in the series, um, the same Mr. Cresswell Baker owns uh, that particular tower and land as well. The hall that Addison built was modelled on Belsay Hall and designed by John Shaw of London and built under the supervision of John Green of Newcastle. Shaw had visited Belsay Hall um, during its construction and wanted to emulate its design here at Cresswell. It was certainly a magnificent structure very opulently decorated, um, huge, huge wall gardens, um, and so much of a landmark here on the coast that passing paddle steamers going north from Newcastle um, would point out the hall as a tourist attraction because it was clearly visible um, from the sea at that point. Um, its magnificence, though, only served the family for just over a hundred years. And then, for some reason, it was sold with all its furniture and grandeur and fittings to the Northumberland Council. 
Once again, it is presumed, and I'm only presuming, that the family must have fallen into financial difficulty. The county council had plans to turn it into a hospital, but that never materialised. In the years that it had stood empty um, following the Cresswell's departure, it had become ruinous and unsafe. The cost of rebuilding it, let alone converting it into a hospital, was just too great. And so the County Council uh, decided to demolish it in 1937. Only remnants of the perimeter wall and stable blocks remain today. The land surrounding the Peel Tower today um, is owned by Golden Sands Holiday Park. Um, and the ruins of the old hall um, are on land owned by Park Dean Resorts. As usual, once I've finished the narrative, I'll take you on a little tour of the inside of the tower, seeing as we have exclusive access today. There's lots more here to look at rather than walls and uh, floor tiles. Um, all sorts of displays um, to grab your interest um, because there's quite a lot to learn about Cresswell Village itself. It, it has quite a, a significant history. This would be the living area. Um, and as you can see, there's a raised wooden platform um, which apparently was there in the original tower. So I guess the wooden floor would have made it a little warmer um, rather than standing on the stone floor. This is the garderobe um, in the corner. And this is where you would have sat rather jovial display there for you and that's where the excrement would have gone down and outside onto the floor uh, this is the kitchen area uh, the fireplace where the cooking would have been done on the spits and this area to the side is where the kitchen slops would have been uh, pushed out to the outside. Now, as I said, Cresswell did have a spiral staircase going down to the lower vaulted floor. Um, this doorway leads up to a gallery or balcony. And that's roughly where the bedroom floor would have been on that sort of height. So you can see there that's quite low ceilings. And as I said earlier, apparently this was the original doorway to the outside. The narrow windows I was talking about before. These are the original stones from when the tower was built. And you can see just to the side, these more modern flagstones that have uh, been added. But these ones here are the originals. And this is the new roof that was installed after the renovations. Money came from the National Lottery Fund and it was all organised by Barry Mead. This is the effigy of the White Lady. Up here on the battlements, there is a turret on the northeast corner of the tower, which would have been the expected direction of any Scottish invasion. Here you can see the newly restored roof and parapets. A beacon was put in for the Queen's Jubilee. The view north towards Druridge Bay. The village of Cresswell. 
and the view south towards Newbiggin. Well, that concludes this additional episode to the Castle series. Um, unexpected, but I hope you've enjoyed it nonetheless. My grateful thanks go to Barry Mead, whose expertise and uh, research um, helped me uh, provide the content for this program. Um, and I also like to thank him for the exclusive access to the tower today. I will be visiting Cresswell again very soon to reveal so much more about this interesting village. Um, watch out for it in my new um, series on the Northumberland coast coming in 2023. So please look out for that. The tower is open to the public on certain days, so please check the Cresswell Tower website to find out when those days are. Anyway, that's it for now. Um, if you haven't already done so, please subscribe to the channel and click on the bell icon to receive the news of the latest releases uh, when they happen. And as I keep saying, it helps the channel to grow and be seen by a wider audience. So, it's goodbye for now. I wish you all good health and happiness, and I hope to see you all extremely soon.